Mm. All right, another Coffee with Coach Rody episode. We are back in the gym this time. Um, pretty short and sweet on the coffee in the, in the tankard today. Uh, from Black Rifle Coffee, we have Fit Fuel. Um, this is a, a medium roast. And where did I see this? Yeah, we got 75% uh, Arabica and 25% Robusta beans. Um, this is, they probably are blending this for uh, an increased caffeine uh, content per se, uh, per gram. Um, I'm not a big fan of this coffee. It's, it's, it's just a generic coffee. You can tell the Robusta is in there. It's a little bit on the bitter side. And I would say the flavor profile is a little bit kind of chalky or pulpy. Um, It's okay. I mean, it, it drinks well, but it's not really for me. I'm, I'm pretty much a 100% uh, Arabica uh, guy. So um, just know if you want to get this one, it's um, it's a, a bit on the bitter side. And the Tankard from 1776 United. Uh, this is another hand-thrown one. The bottom is is um, nice and like, smooth clay. Uh, don't tread on me. It's... Uh, Got a great logo. Um, the mug shape, it, it's kind of standard. The handle's right straight up and down. I prefer one that's a little bit more angled. Uh, everything about it, it's a, a regular mug, nothing too special about the lip or the overall size of it. Um, I kind of, the, the coloring, the coloring is nice. Um, it's not, I, I have a mossy, a mossy green mug out now that I think I like better than, than this color. Um, one nice thing, I had this in the truck the other day and as I was driving, I had my hand down and I was just running my finger over over the, the logo here um, and those those uh, symmetrical ridges or semi-symmetrical ridges offer a nice kind of uh, fiddle, um, you know, uh, <laughs> for your, your hands to keep busy on, right? A, a, fidget, a fidget mug. Bitter. Okay, um, topic for today. We're gonna go pretty easy for me. Uh, why did I throw for Canada? It's a question I get fairly often from from clients and and parents and and uh, just kind of the general public. Of, there's a few misconceptions about out there about you know why I chose to throw for Canada versus you know versus the USA and, and whatnot. So let's go back to the very beginning. Um, 2000. 2007, I graduate from Mount Union College, and a month later, uh, I go to a track clinic in Grand Rapids, Michigan at Calvin College, and the uh, the track coach there, Norm Zelstra, had invited me down, uh, or invited me up, rather, to come to the clinic early on, like January or February of that year, and he said, hey, we got this guy coming in. We didn't know, I didn't know anything about him. He's a Bonduchuk, this is coming. He's the best hammer throw coach in the world, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, I trusted Norm, Norm was one of my good friends, and so I said, okay, yeah, I was right after I graduate, I got nothing going on, I'll be there, I'll come to the clinic. Knew nothing about Bonnachuk uh, before going. Uh, let's see, I did a little bit of cursory research before I went, but not a whole lot. I still went in just thinking, knowing he was a guru, but not much about him. Uh, so we get there, and there was a throw and lecture clinic, and we, I can't remember which was first, throws or lectures, but um, sitting in the lectures, there were a lot of uh, D1 coaches in the room. Uh, mostly, well, I guess from all over the country, but quite a few Michigan D1 coaches. And Bonachuk was presenting this information, and he's, he's ESL, you know, or probably English fourth language or so, you know, he's, um, so it's kind of, he's, he's uh, lecturing in broken English, and he's got all these slides and graphs and stuff, and I had no idea what the slides were. I had no idea the content, the information, the periodization, the volume intensity curves. I had never seen anything like that. I was a, I was a writing and education major in, in college. So, dump truck. Um, so Bonnerchuk is delivering this lecture and I have no idea what the content is, but I'm following the logic, if that makes sense. I. I'm following the system of information that he's presenting. I'm understanding how it all flows together, even if I don't know what I'm looking at. 
and I'm looking around the room and there's a whole bunch of athletes there and the athletes are tuned out. Like they're on their phones, they're like have no idea what they're what they're doing there. And the only other people in the room who were like getting it were these D1 coaches. And I was like, I'm following this, I'm getting this. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm I'll, uh, set apart from the rest of the other athletes, right? A little bit different. Uh, and so that was my, my lecture experience with him. And then we had the throwing sessions and I was one of the only shot putters there because mostly hammer throwers, right? And the uh, way Calvin set up, you have the hammer cage and the shot puts right next to it. So one person can stand in the middle and coach both events. And uh, I'm throwing shot and he's got a line of like 15 hammer throwers. And he stands in the middle and he watches the hammer thrower go and coaches them. And then he watches one of my throws. And then he watches the hammer thrower. And then he watches one of my throws and the hammer thrower of my throws. So I was getting like 50% of his time, one athlete, 50% of his time. And I was kind of being humbled by this. I was like, oh, but, you know, he's taking his time on me. He's giving me so, a lot of attention here. And within five minutes, okay, um, see, I, I could barely understand a word he was saying. People say uh, that, um, I, I always tell people, you need about two weeks with them to kind of understand the, the language barrier. And uh, so I, well, I wasn't getting a whole lot of words, but it was a lot of body language coaching. Okay, through body language coaching, in five minutes, he taught me forces that I never knew existed. I never knew your body could feel the forces that he taught me in five minutes. And from that point on, I knew that he could teach me something that nobody else could. Um, nobody else could in North America, at least at that time. Okay, you have to remember, special strength was virtually unheard of in North America. Over underweight training, there were only a few coaches really doing it. Um, it was uh, uncharted territory. And those technical cues, you know, bent leg throwing, stay on the ground, uh, no lift. That was, that was like crazy for North American people to hear. It, was, it wasn't even anywhere in, in it wasn't even in the, in the vocabulary of, of coaching, okay? Um, the vocabulary that coaches use to talk about training, talk about throwing today is different than it was in 2007. And it's all because of Bonacek, stuff Bonacek brought to North America, right? So I knew he could teach me things. And so I go back home and I was fixing up my mom's house at the time and I didn't really have a job. And um, Norm kept calling me and saying, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do after you graduate? You get a job yet? You know, and he's like, I think you should, I, Think you should go to Kamloops. Like, why not? Why not go and live a life worth telling? Live a life worth reading about, right? Live a book, is what he said to me. And I, I was thinking on it, thinking on it. I was like, you know, yeah, yeah. And I, it got to around like October, and I said, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do it. And I worked in a factory, and I saved up three thousand dollars. And by February, I was. I was ready to go. I, I, I had to leave then, otherwise I knew I was gonna lose the year. And, and um, so I packed up my truck and while I asked Bonnet Truck, I said, you know, is it okay if I come train? I was not invited to train the group, I invited myself. And uh, I asked if I could come train and uh, they said yes. And so I packed up all my possessions in my pickup truck and I drove all the way across the country into Canada with $3,000 in my pocket uh, <laughs> and, and no, no plans other than to train. Um, I had a place to land. Dane Miller uh, was training there at the time. He had an apartment and uh, he, he let me kind of crash at his, at his pad for a week or two until I found my own place. Um, when I crossed the border, uh, I was given a visitor's visa, a six month visitor's visa. At the end of six months, I had to come back to the border. Then I could reapply for another visa, but in six months I had to come back. And so that was where I stood. And when I embarked on this trip, uh, it wasn't to go to Kamloops and if I run out of money, I come home. This was, I had talked with Mac Wilkins, who was at Concordia at the time. And if I could not sustain myself in Canada, because I couldn't work, right? Um, then I was going to go south to Oregon and continue at Concordia, get a job in Oregon and, and train uh, with Mac at Concordia. And then, you know, every couple months or so, make a trip up to Kamloops and continue with, with Bonnachuk stuff. Uh, that kind of, that was what I was looking for. 
And I talked uh, a year and a well, yeah, about a year and a half ago now with Mark Valenti, uh, Refined Savage uh, podcast. And I was telling him this story on the podcast, and and he said you burned your ships. And I I was like, what? I, what? No, because I burn your bridges. I never I never burn a bridge. Uh, never ever burn bridges. But he said you burned your ships. You got to the coast and. There was no option of going home, so you burned your ship so you couldn't go home, right? Um, and that's absolutely what I did. When I left home to go train, I, I was not coming back. I was going to find a way to keep learning from Bonnachuk no matter what came my way, okay? And this has now become a motto for roadie sport of burn your ships, meaning don't keep any lifelines. If you're gonna do something, do it wholeheartedly and unabashed go for it and never turn back uh, so that's all the setup now i'm in canada uh training we train 10 times a week and uh i just i ground i put my nose down and i ground and i didn't know what day it was sometimes i didn't even know uh, what hour, well, I knew what hour of the day it was, but I didn't know what week, what day of the week. It was just a revolving cycle of training. I slept on ice for six months, adapting to the training volume. Every single nap, packed in ice, pee bags and corn bags all around my body to keep up with the, the volume intensity curve, right? Uh, and I just, I ground and ground and ground for years and years and years. And, uh, and, so how did I end up throwing for Canada? Okay, so I moved there to learn from Bonnachuk. I wanted to be a track coach. And I knew you could, I could learn things from him. And so I went and how you learned was you train. Okay, so I'm training, training, training. And over time I got visitor visas, then I get a work visa, uh, and then I get uh, permanent, I apply for permanent residency, and then I become a permanent resident. And all that immigration paperwork was in process to just try and stay in the country. Okay, staying with Bondachuk as long as I could. And so we end up, we arrive at uh, 2011, okay, 2011, and I get my permanent residency in uh, 2010, 2012. No. Yeah, permanent residency, November 2011. I get my permanent residency. And then once I had my permanent residency, uh, what happened in my training was I had become a world-class thrower, okay? I had thrown, uh, let's see, I got my permanent residency in November and in mid-December, I threw 2077, I think, at the Kent State Indoor, okay? I got my, I got my permanent residency and uh, yeah, I went to Canada. I went to Kent and I threw 2077, which was A standard. I got A standard like three weeks after becoming a permanent resident. And it was coming to an Olympic year, and I was at a level of uh, throwing A standard, qualified for the Olympics. And so uh, at that point, then we went to the, the member of uh, government in our, in our district, uh, MP, member of parliament, and we were able to fast track a citizenship uh, for myself. And and once I was a citizen, then I, I could throw for Canada. Now, the reason for throwing for Canada was I had lived there for four years, okay? And when I moved to Canada, I had talked with a couple other coaches about training, and everyone said, well, you're not strong enough. You're not really big enough. You haven't really thrown far enough yet. Like, you're probably not going not gonna to make it, you know? And that wasn't to the Olympics. That was just throwing, like, 65 feet just trying to throw a average good distance right and so i was kind of like nobody really believed or said yeah like you you do it right and um so bondachuk bondachuk system turned me into the world-class thrower that i was living in canada uh canadian nutrition canadian sports science canadian physical therapy was way ahead of the curve than the United States. Um, and all of those things compounded into me being a Canadian athlete. Me as a professional shot putter was a product 
of the Canadian sports system, 100% through and through. Uh, I would not have achieved what I did if I had not been in Canada all those years. Um, and even like, and then once I was a national team member and stuff, the, the uh, therapy techniques that we had access to, the things that were being done to my body, um, were not many people had heard about it in the US, just a few people were doing it. And if, and if they were doing the techniques, it wasn't right. It wasn't anywhere near what the Canadian therapists were doing, okay? They were years and years ahead. Uh, and, and that still holds true today. Um, just a lot of, just things like IMS and some of the massage techniques I was getting were, were cutting edge. Um, super, super blessed to have been where I was, when I was, Bonnetruck's periodization, his technical model, the Canadian nutrition, Canadian sport science, all of that is what allowed me to throw 21, 21 29 injured. Um, I probably, I would say a 21 50, 22 meter shape at my best. Um, and that's what allowed me to compete with the world's best. Things have changed now, okay? Professional athletes have adopted uh, a lot of the training principles and the training, uh, the throwing technique that Vonnechuk used with uh, Dylan Armstrong and I. And now the world average has gone up, has gone through the roof. I wouldn't, I wouldn't stand a chance now. I, I would be a top 15 maybe guy in the world now. Um, so it was, the timing was right for me and I was in the right place and I was able to do something fantastic with, uh, with my abilities. I feel very, very fortunate for that. Um, so it wasn't all roses though. I, um, I got my citizenship, um, late in the year in 2011, uh, but I didn't see, I was qualified to go to the 2012 Indoor World Championships. Okay. But the problem was I had competed, I had competed as an American for all those years, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. And I even did a meet early in 2012, like the uh, Tyson Invitational in uh, Arkansas in like February, I think. And my result, I don't know, I'm not sure what it says now, but initially my result was that as an American thrower because Athletics Canada had not filed paperwork with IAAF um, early enough to have me transferred as a Canadian athlete. I had never represented the United States internationally. Um, I'd never done a major international competition. And um, so there was no wait period for me, but just the paperwork hadn't been filed. And so, you know, as, as much as, as late as February, 2012, I was throwing as an, as an American. Uh, and so, you know, I, it's just kind of funny how circumstances and if you, if you put your nose down and you grind at what you love, you never know where you're going to end up. Okay. Cause 20, 2008, 2009, I had no idea that I would ever end up being a Canadian funded Canadian team athlete and end up going to, you know, the 2012 Olympics and the 2014 Commonwealth games. And I was qualified for 2012 indoor world championships, but I, didn't, I wasn't able to go because of paperwork snafu. That's a whole separate story in itself. And then um, I was qualified, I was ranked third in the world for the 2013 world championships in Moscow. And uh, I was too injured, I couldn't go, I didn't get on the plane. Um, and so I, you know, I, I was able to do two major championships, I would qualified for four, but that's just kind of my, my journey, my story. And uh, yeah, training, training as a Canadian athlete, uh, throwing for Canada, the things that Canada did for me in terms of turning me into that professional athlete. Uh, I really believe I, there's no other place I could have gotten that. And it was a life-changing experience. And I would encourage all others to pursue your dreams, pursue the itch to the nth degree. And uh, if you have to eat rotten fruit and pick change out of uh, vomit piles on the floor just to make ends meet, um, it's all worth it.